um, just looking at a, a small model of a bit of the consciousness that we have there's three main stages number one is a victim stage where we kind of think everything happens to us so we're like we're looking for something to blame um, and if you look around the world um, as sad as it is generally most people kind of live at this stage where uh, when something bad happens they're kind of trying to think who can we blame this on how can we how can we blame this on someone else and the reason we're kind of addicted to that state of consciousness is because um, <laughs> kind of it takes the responsibility away from us doesn't it now if i can blame um if i can blame the economy for my problems or if i can blame donald trump for my problems or if i can blame uh like something beyond me something which isn't in my control then it makes my life easy i can just you know blame everyone else so that's kind of the first stage then the third stage was where we get this awareness and this is why we pray five times a day this is why we do a gratitude exercise this is why we make dua this is even why we fast in Ramadan. The main kind of crux of every spiritual exercise, um, and even yesterday we mentioned this, even the crux of the Quran, actually. Um, actually, I want to test you guys, man. He was listening yesterday. So from the 6,000 odd verses which are in the Quran, how many of them actually refer to, to the rulings of like how to pray or how to fast or how to do wudu? About... Okay, that, ma mashallah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yes, Brother Ramani? <laughs> yeah, so, and it is surprising from the 6,000, um, 6,500 verses, less than 500 refer to rulings. And even then, we looked at one example. One of the most explicit examples of a ruling, um, like explicit, is when Allah talks about how to do wudu in the Quran because it's quite direct Allah says that like, wash your face wash your arms wash your head wash your feet um, but it's it's just the it's just the obligatory things not the specifics of doing rinsing your mouth and rinsing your nose and starting with your right hand and all these kind of things meaning that um, the crux of the Quran the majority of the Quran is to solidify our beliefs is to get us aware is to is to actually increase our awareness of of Allah so again, um, that's why we do all these practices. Take us from this state of victimhood where stuff's kind of happening to us. We're kind of not really here for any important reason at all. Um, and in reality, we realize that Allah has created us. And in between, there's stage two. Yeah, I should really have put this on the screen, shouldn't I? I'll try and make a, a bit of a diagram for this. But being in a victim stage, realizing that Allah's in the middle, it's kind of where you become in control. Um, and where you're actually able to realize that. For example, if you pray salah, you will feel more connected with Allah. If you take time for reciting the Quran on a daily basis, you'll feel more in touch with Allah. If you take time to look after your body, you again you'll feel more in touch with with um, with your body and the responsibility which you have to Allah to look after your body. That's just one example. Obviously, we have responsibility to our families as well, and and the world around us. But that was just how we started off. Then we went on to, wow, man, that went quick, you know. Um, then we went on to um, uh, the fact that today's day 10 of Ramadan and then I just asked you guys to share how just for the past 10 days, Ramadan 2020, these 10 days which we've had so far, what, um, like I wanted to get everyone a bit more in touch with their, with their own identity to some extent. So now our identity as a Muslim, wow man, lots, lots of recent admissions, I'll just mute, I'll just mute everyone quickly and I'll speak to you in a minute. Um, but really what I wanted to do is just get everyone in touch with the fact of where your identity is at the moment because it's a lot to do with your identity if your identity is somebody who's in touch with Allah somebody who's Allah's controlling who's, who's like um, who's try, his purpose of life is to is to serve the world and to you know like manifest the gifts which Allah has given you um, you know then that then that obviously is uh, it affects every aspect of your life just the just the identity which we have so I asked so I asked everyone to share um, Ian started us off, so I'm going to just open up quickly. If anyone else wants to be brave, otherwise we'll move on to the to the next slide, man. Uh, um, does anyone else want to share anything? So I th I think um, what Ian shared was just what he one of his prayers, which he uh, one of the questions which he asked this morning, um, and he was he was really um, surprised and like pleasantly surprised with the with the clarity of the of the response which he received. Um, and I learned from that that just is just asking the right question is really really important. Anyone else? Come on, man, it's been ten days, man. I'm sure there's something we can share from ten days of Ramadan. 
any kind of insights we've had, even from some of the stuff we've discussed in this class. Um, okay, man, you're not gonna. Uh, Sister Nuzha has joined. Alhamdulillah. Asalaamu Alaikum, Asmil. Asalaamu Alaikum, Sister Nuzha. Uh, and who else joined? So, uh, oh, Fadil. Asalaamu Alaikum, Fadil. How are you, man? Okay. Oh, Asalaamu Alaikum, Asmil. Can see you as well. Good to have you, man. Okay, man. So. Now, what we've, uh, one of the key tools which we've been working on over the past couple of days, and I wanted to bring a bit more clarity, was du'a. Because we've, been, we've realized that this is something which helps us, um, what, the way I wanted to summarize is it helps us shift our identity in a very quick kind of way. Because um, that's what du'a really is there for, very often. Um, and this is why when we do this exercise of figuring out um, you know, what we have at the moment, doing a gratitude exercise, um, and realizing that at the moment we've had 10 days of Ramadan and seeing as none of you answered, um, and apart from Ian, <clears throat> I'll just give a bit of insight on what's happened so far. Alhamdulillah, we've come together. A lot of you have been here for two, three, four days. Some of you have been here every day. Um, and regularly, we've just got in touch again with, with why we exist as human beings I and mean, where, we're, where we're kind of going. Um, and when that's... When we become aware of that, of where we want to do, what where we, um, what we want to shift our identity towards, um, then we realize that there is some little action points which we can do, there's little exercises we can do, there's classes we can attend which will help that. Um, you know, we can fast and do all these things. And then on top of doing the little exercises, there's the added step which we do in this class, which is bring a heightened awareness to every one of those exercises. Something which may be... Um, we think is very simple, like praying five times a day. When you just add a bit of a few questions there, like what is prayer? How's my prayer? How can I improve my prayer? Simple, simple questions. It just adds a it adds a, a nuance and it adds a heightened sense of awareness of how prayer is showing up in your life. Uh, and then what du'a does is, um, if gratitude is kind of to get us in touch with our past, I think du'a is what kind of pushes and pushes us in the other direction. In fact, when um, for those of you, this is going back a couple of months, I think, when we done the gratitude exercise at Colchester Mosque, uh, that was open to sisters as well, so some of the sisters might have come as well, actually, that day. Um, I think we had a good attendance that day. So um, one of the questions which came up is that if we continually just do gratitude and be grateful and content and happy with how our lives are, then how are we going to um, like have a vision for the future? So I think du'a um, gives that futuristic kind of, um, approach uh, and futuristic perspective where we try to worry a little bit about okay we're good now we've we're done you know we're, we're kind of quite good where we are today but we do also want to we do also want to you know really make some solid some solid progress um, going forward as well so that's what du'a that's what du'a really does is based on where you are today it gives you that little that little vision for where it is that we also want to be does that make sense for everyone um, and now it kind of helps you shift your identity more as well. So if at the moment you have a certain awareness of Allah, if at the moment you have a certain um, awareness of the of the relationships which you're in, you have a certain awareness of the of the career which you're currently pursuing. Um, by doing du'a, you kind of, or you have a slightly bigger vision for for your career, for your relationships, for your health, for your for your relationship with Allah as well. And obviously the. Um, the Prophet وسلم, he comes and explains a lot of the common obstacles which we have. For example, um, in terms of one of the one of the syndromes which we end up having um, is is a syndrome of uh, I think I put it as um, I'll be happy when yeah. So if I have X, Y, and Z, like for example, we we we, um, we kind of consist, uh, constantly live in a state of if I have a certain thing, then I'll be happy. As opposed to, Alhamdulillah, I have a certain thing. And then the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he explains that um, uh, the, the common state of a human is that even if they were to have two valleys of gold, um, despite having that much, we would naturally feel like it's not enough and we'll want a third valley of gold. Um, so that's one common syndrome which the Prophet ﷺ brings our awareness to. So then we do something like gratitude and then we're able to kind of overcome that syndrome and actually realize that Alhamdulillah we're in a good position um, from, from which we can go forward. And some of the beliefs which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instills within the Quran, for example, the belief that Allah is helping you, Allah is with you, Allah is trying to look after you. Um, and to, we'll come back to that. Uh, I, I, 
hopefully at the end we'll just go through those few questions which we which we went through yesterday um, as well and we've already covered this slide that's on the screen now uh, when we spoke about how the majority of the Quran actually um, and even all of our spiritual exercises they're there to deepen those uh, beliefs and I, um, just to go deep on this slide can everyone see the slide here um, just to explain this in a slightly different way um, it's, it's not particularly different we, we, we've done this before but I just want to um, so I think someone's in the waiting room um, but I just want to go deep on this so um, just to understand that gap again between knowing something um, and believing something um, and so, so sometimes there's a lot of um, especially like some, from some of my the people that I teach um, like there's a bit of resistance about this idea so people don't always like to go too deep into this but obviously we all know for example just to take the simple belief that we all have which is that Allah created us um, and is looking after us let, let, let's take those that belief um, now obviously that's something which every one of you here alhamdulillah believes deeply um, but at the same time like if you if you only understand it as as information um, then it might be a bit like abstract it might be a bit um, superficial but the the point of the spiritual exercise the point of praying five times a day the reason we fast the reason we, we get you know we go deep in these spiritual exercises is because that the belief needs deepening all the time it needs strengthening it needs re re um, enforcing uh, does that make sense so that's why we have these kind of things so the, the majority of the stuff we actually do as Muslims uh, in terms of the stuff which relates to our religion is to deepen those beliefs so I think that's that's um, very very important so now coming back to the dua thing yeah so when we um, realize where we are and we realize where we kind of want to go there's three main ways which we can um, which we can go about this process of changing um, so <clears throat> what I want to do is from the, the du'as from the sunnah for example um, I personally I personally think nearly all of them nearly all of the du'as which we are, which we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they focus on shifting our identity yeah um, rather than the outcome or the process yeah now what I've been doing over the past couple of days is not just making du'a for shifting your identity because um, because the du'a is in Arabic and it's a really deep du'a, if you do it regularly, it will have its effect. But also focusing on the outcome and the process will get you more in touch to how the to what kind of identity shift we're we're going for. So, so I want any of you to bring up any du'a from the Sunnah. Um, so, so any du'a from the Quran or or from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which we can use as an example. So, so I don't want to um, I don't want to say. I want you guys to come up with. So, so any du'a which you say. Um, just any example, yes. Who, who's that? Dr. Ramani, yes, please. Good. MashaAllah. Okay. So, how. Th that's really good, man. MashaAllah. Nice song. So, Rabbana Atina. This is from the Quran itself. Um, not from the Sunnah of the Prophet. So, no, this is Prophet. So, Allah will say this dua as well. Um, so it is from the Sunnah, but I mean it's got the status of the Quran. It's a dua which is taught by Allah Himself. So Rabbana Atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adab al nar. So the, all three are identity shifts. So fi uh, dunya hasana, we ask Allah to give us good in the world. Yeah. How does that shift your identity? It makes you aware that um, Allah is going to be looking after you. He's going to be giving you. Basically, He's going to give you what you need. Um, when you need it, you're asking Allah to give you what you need in the world, yeah. And hasana, as in the best, uh, the things that you actually really need at the time that you need it. Um, and just to go a little bit deeper here, um, like we might not always know what is hasana. In fact, we might get something from Allah which is hasana, and it might be slightly painful at the time that you receive it. So you might not even realize that it's hasana. And you might treat it as sayyah, you might think this is like a big calamity, like I wish this didn't even happen. And you might even make dua for the hasana to go away um, when you come in English. Um, so that's very important to realize this, that Allah gives us hasana, the things that we need at the time that you need it. 
Um, and how that shifts your identity is that now, if you make this dua, you now become aware that Allah gives you what you need at the time that you need. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fi akhirati hasana. Um, this is that Allah gives you in the hereafter also what you need. So, how does that apply to your life? Because you're going to have to do certain actions to, to build your hereafter, to build your paradise and to build your kind of refuge and protection from, from, from Jahannam. And again, that requires certain actions from you. So, here we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to actually live our lives in a way so that our hereafter is hereafter is um, is good for us yeah and the last one um, so, so, so again um, you could say that um, is kind of asking for paradise um, is kind of protection from protection from um, the fire um, and again protection from fire what kind of person gets protection from fire well, again, if, if you want to split this door into these two categories, one is um, getting to paradise and one is your protection from from Jahannam. So now in order to be somebody who goes into paradise, there's certain stuff you need to do. And in order to be somebody who's protected from Jahannam, you need to stay away from sins. So the identity that you're developing is somebody who does the things which get you, gets you to Jannah and somebody who does the things which gets you uh, protected from Jahannam. Is that okay with everyone? Does that make sense? Um, and I'm glad Dr. Ramani gave that example because it was quite a simple one, I think, for everyone to understand how most of the du'as from the Qur'an and the Sunnah actually just reinforce a certain identity which we're meant to have as a Muslim. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions about that so far? Okay. Gee, no questions at all. Do you, man, you can be open with your questions, man. Or if anything which I've said so far is like, doesn't make sense, or it's kind of, um, like, even if it just contradicts something which you um, know about Islam in any way. Okay, good. We're all on the same page. Okay, so now what we've been doing over the past couple of days is instead of making dua for the identity shift, I've been saying that find the action point to make dua for. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Because if we keep, um, because although the Sunnah and the Quran teaches us to make du'a for the identity shift itself, if you miss the point, um, and you just like Allah's going to make this all happen, um, you've got to realize that there are actions as well which you have to be taking to get there. Yeah, and bef so there's three ways to um, to work on change for change to happen. The most powerful, without without any question, is the one the Quran uses, the one the Sunnah uses. Which is to shift your identity. Yeah, that's the quickest way. I, I, um, I just want to quickly explain this with a very, very quick example. Yes, brother Asmin. So nice to have you, to hear your voice. Are you gonna, are you, are you gonna say something? No, you're not. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so for example, let, let's take like a the first taqwa area, which is your health. Yeah. So let's say you wanna um, get, you wanna, um, I don't know, man. So some of you might want to lose weight, some of you might want to, I don't know, go to the gym. Um, I'm, I'm going a bit too... Let's say you want to improve your health in some way. So now there's outcome. So, let, um, so let's take a common problem we have in this country, man, of, of obesity and people being overweight. So somebody, his outcome, what would an overweight person want to do in terms of outcome? They would want to lose 10 kilograms, for example. So that's outcome, which is nice. Good idea, perhaps. So you can say that I need to lose 10 kilograms. So now, um, this is the outcome I want to achieve. So let me keep that in mind and kind of carry on living my life. Okay, good plan. Then there's process. Process is, is a, I think it's, it's a lot better than just focusing on the outcome because now you're actually focusing on the process. So now you're saying that instead of, um, uh, instead of saying I need to lose 10 kilograms, you're going to say that I'm going to... Um, change my diet, change the food that I put in my mouth. So instead of eating um, a chocolate cake every every day or whatever the problem is, um, I'm going to eat an avocado every day. Or 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 even as most um, a, a lot of diet programs nowadays, instead of focusing on what to cut out, they focus on what to put in. So let's say we put in one and a half liters of water every day, or we put in a salad every day, or we put in. So this is a process. Yeah. Um, and for those of you that want to go to the gym, so you go to the gym three days a week. And you, you like the more detail in the process, I guess the better this plan will be. That would also help you help you become more healthy. 
But then there's the last one, which is actually shifting your identity. Which is now you're somebody who, who you know, you might, I mean, plan one is lose 10 kg. That's a good kind of thing to do. Process, a bit more detail, like I'm actually going to eat different food. The third one is like, forget the outcome, forget the process. Like, I am somebody who looks after their body. And this is actually the most uh, powerful of the three in terms of even even if you just look at it in terms of a motivation, like you'll struggle to if you if your motivation is I need to lose ten kilos, you'll struggle to get out of bed to actually get to the gym. Same with the process. It might be a bit more powerful. You might be able to do it more than fifty percent of the time. But also, when you shift your identity, and you say that I'm not an unhealthy person, I'm a healthy person. Um, then you don't. You're a person who doesn't eat unhealthy food. You're a person who worships your body, who looks after your body in a way that your body is actually the way the way you want it to be, or the way that it needs to be for you to look after it. So that's a shift in identity. Um, so that's why, again, it's it's good to make the du'as from the Quran and the Sunnah, where we where we directly just focus on the identity. I am a pious Muslim. Like after Salah, we we ask Allah to make us really pious, to make us connected to Allah, to protect us from Jannah, uh, from Jahannam, to, to to grant us uh, entry into paradise. That in itself, and your identity will shift as a person. If you're somebody who's striving for Jannah, obviously you're going to act in a certain way. If you're somebody who's striving to be protected from the fire of Jahannam, your whole life's going to change. Um, but sometimes we do need to also become aware of what does that involve in terms of process, and also what does that involve in terms of even a slightly more short-term short-term outcome. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, so that's why um, over the past few days we've been kind of focusing on some kind of action points. Um, so obviously we've done the gratitude, we realize where we, we what we've done over the past few, few well over the course of our whole life to become to become who we are today. Um, and then we looked at where we kind of want to take that, what kind of trajectory does that kind of have for the future? And then some simple kind of action points, um, which means that we can kind of actually have a process so that we know what that means for today and for the future. So we had some action points from then. So, so who remembers this? You guys should remember, man. Um, what are the action points which we've kind of, which we've kind of put here for this Ramadan? So we, we've done this regularly, and some of you should have made your own as well. Um, but I made some for you guys. Who remembers any of them? Any of the action points so far that we've done? Um, to actually um, okay good the, uh, the other person Hamdan what do you say good okay that's really good that, that's a really good action point anyone else good the MIQs and the empowering questions and asking the questions that's good. So those are three pretty, pretty, pretty good ones, man. I think um, Salman like covered everything. <laughs> I was expecting to carry on asking, but but Ian said the one and a half liters, which is the one we done for our health. So if you wanna, um, if you feel you've got a responsibility to look after your body, um, and when it's iftar time, you find it difficult to control yourself, um, <laughs> especially in our culture, man. I know in my culture, like today, man, everyone's just cooking for the whole day. Uh, but anyway, man. So we have a, we end up with a lot of food in front of us at iftar time, and in that sh short window of like seven eight hours, where we're allowed to eat, I think we have too much food, man. So one of the action points we said to solve this issue was to try and drink, try and make sure your food you're as hydrated as you need to be. So having one and a half liters of water, um, and doing that kind of means that then this other issue of eating too much it kind of calms down. So that was a good action point which Ian mentioned. Um, Hamdan mentioned the three, uh, the actual spiritual exercises themselves, yeah, which is making sure you're doing du'a, making sure you're actually praying your salah with some concentration, um, and gratitude, and actually making sure you're doing some kind of um, some kind of um, gratitude exercise on a daily basis. So, you're, and like I said yesterday, this can mean just three minutes. Yeah, I think minimum should be three minutes. So you find three minutes every day. To ask the right questions, and that leads us on to what Salman says, said, um, which is actually finding time to ask the right questions. 
Yeah, so I think these are three really nice action points which you guys have summarized. Um, and I think we focused a lot on questions overall, which is having the MIQ, which is the most important questions. And the MIQ can apply then to all of the things which Hamdan says. So you'll have the most important question for for the way that you're praying. So how are you praying? How How is that praying going to get better? How is your awareness going to increase? How is your focus going to get better? Um, the dua, uh, which is kind of what we're focusing on today. So how is your dua going to actually uh, push you in the right direction? How is it going to shift your identity? Because like uh, Dr. Ramani said a really nice dua there. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasan. But um, like the, ident the shift that we're having, is there an action there as well? So I think that's what I want to just um, finish today on. Is that, is... Do the, does the thing we're making du'a for have an action with it? Does that make sense? So Ian's thing, which he said, was actually an action point in and of itself. One and a half liters of water, are you able to do that? Now, I, I'm not like forcing this on everyone. For those of you that struggle with one and a half liters, maybe aim for one liter or whatever, something which pushes you, but something which will help you, you know, get, make sure you're hydrated properly for the, you know, for the whole day. Um, but if you're struggling with that, that's something to definitely make dua for. Yeah? The other point which Hamdan says, um, trying to do gratitude on a daily basis, if you're struggling to find three minutes every day, that's definitely something to make dua for, to find that three minutes every day, to schedule for that organization to have that um, time. Um, and again, to actually spend some time coming to this class, much of all of you are here, um, but some of you that struggle to come, um, definitely it would be good to to be able to make du'a, to be able to come on time. I want to bring up the questions which we went through yesterday, man, because I think it'll be good to to go through them again, man. Uh, just as we, just to finish off today, inshallah. Um, I can't. I just trust her, man. She does it. She does it every day, man. She comes at the same time every day. Uh, I think she, I think she wait. <laughs> She's actually pretty good on her routine, isn't it? Quarter to seven, I'm doing that. Anyway, man. So, so um, where was I, man? So um, just for today, I want you just to be able to. So for everyone, as an action point, is to try and make a list of action points, which is the things which you're trying to actually bring alive, bring into your life. And I think Salman's answer of the questions is actually a very big answer, actually. Because, um, you know, we've got the MIQ as a question, we've got empowering questions, um, and we've got the questions which we're just about to go through today. And I think we'll finish off on these questions. Um, and just before we um, go into it, just the importance of actually, once you ask a question, um, and this is going back to what, how Ian um, started off the lesson, actually, with his little um, anecdote of, of what happened this morning. Um, and I think this is actually quite important, is when you ask a question, um, it is important to have that kind of um, surrender at that time. Like Because if you're trying to use your logical mind to, to answer the question, you might miss the point a little bit. Uh, so it's important not to be really controlling and obsessed with getting the right answer or making sure that you're kind of um, answering the question the way that you think you're meant to be answering the question. You might not know the answer. Yeah, I think that's an important kind of point that when you ask the question, you might not know the answer. In fact, that's actually very important to, to um, give yourself maybe five, ten seconds where you're in a state of curiosity um, and not in a state of knowing. Because there's no point asking the question if you already know the answer. So the whole point of the question is to is to kind of trigger that trigger that um, surrender and obviously surrender is humility it's the opposite of pride isn't it um, and I think we do um, the, I think the reason we like being in the victim state is because of the pride that we have um, but anyway man so let's start off with, um, with just a bit of breathing man make sure make sure you're breathing properly and um, I'll give you a couple of seconds we, we've done this a lot of times man but just trying to um, uh, be aware of where your breath is um, if you don't have no idea, then again, just ask yourself the question: Where is my breath? And how can I, how can I, um, be more aware of where my where my breath is? And don't worry too much about this. And it's not it's not about controlling the breath even. 
at this stage. It's more about just noticing if the breath is going in, if it's going out. But it's good if you can notice when the breath comes in through your nose as opposed to anywhere else. I and mean, just notice it come out as well. And then we'll do these questions, man. I like these questions, man. I think they were good when we have done these questions yesterday. Um, so just asking the question and remembering, not trying to answer with your logical mind, because that's not very helpful at all, if I'm honest. Um, trying to wait for the answer. Yeah. And so the first question. What if I am exactly where I'm meant to be today? Um, and if that question doesn't make sense, just um, to give a bit of context, just your the life which you've lived until until this moment of your life um, is the context for that question. Yeah, so everything that's happened from the moment you were born um, until today, everything that's happened. Um, what if what if like every every single one of those things was um, was meant to happen, and therefore you today are exactly at the stage of your journey where, where you're meant to be. And in fact, to push it to the next level, how about if you ask yourself, how can I trust that I today am actually ahead of schedule? I'm, I'm ahead of where I'm meant to be. I've actually managed to achieve more. And just ask yourself, do, um, do I not love the illusion of control which I sometimes have over my life? And do I believe that Allah is in control of, of, of my life? And how do I trust um, that Allah is on my side. Allah is helping me. Allah's one of the beings who's in my contact list. Who, whenever we need help, he's, he's there for us. How, how do I, how do I increase that trust? And again, remembering just to give a bit of time between um, the question um, and before you try and figure out the answer. Just allow time for the question, for the answer to kind of come up. It might not even be the answer. Might not always come in words. Um, if that makes any sense. It doesn't have to be in words. It can be like a feeling. Next question, how would, I, how would I behave if I knew that regardless of what I do, I couldn't go off Allah's plan. Allah's plan, which is decided for my life, is already written. Um, and I can't go wrong from that. I can't deviate from, from Allah's plan. And how can I let go and trust Allah fully? And, and why is it that, that I love this illusion of control? And one of the reasons maybe we do like the, this control that we have is because obviously like if we don't control anything and if we don't decide anything, if we don't plan, if we don't envision, if we don't like aim for big things in the future um, it might become a bit lazy but ha like is that really true though like if we stop uh, thinking that we're in control and we believe that Allah's in control will that make us more lazy or will it actually make us less lazy And how do I thank the control? Like we've all got some, we all like to have this control. So how do we kind of be grateful for the control that we've exerted as well? It's not like necessarily a bad thing. We've been grateful for all of the control and it's important as we go forward as well. But how do we be grateful for that and realise that going forward, um, we can also let go of it? And how can I become more aware of how I can use the unique gifts which Allah has given me 
um, to serve the world. Shalom, man. <laughs> Does anyone want to answer? I don't know, I think we have five minutes left. Gee, man, I'll give you guys some time to, to say something, man. Is anyone going to say anything? Or, or shall we leave it there? Or shall we read some Quran? We can read the, some du'as if you guys. Cast my home down, man. Make me, give me more. Mm. Okay, go on, man. Make sure your breath's there, man. We do the du'a for Quran. A'udhu uh, billahi. من الشيطان الرجيم. Good. We practice the first half quite a lot of it. The second half of this من الشيطان الرجيم. Um, just uh, what I want you to do is, if you can see my mouse, the first letter is uh, flap. Noon is flap. Sheen is round. So من Sheen is generally a round letter. So your lips will become round. Keep that in mind. Um, the ya is flat, so shay, uh, the lips go flat again. Um, and then twa is obviously uh, rounded. Twa. Um, so just give a bit, of, that's a bit of a difficult letter if I'm honest. Um, so it's a T sound, ta, but it's round. So twa, twa, um, and it's stretched. And the reason it's stretched is because of that, because there's the alif there, isn't it? So twa, so it's slowing down a bit, giving time to that. Um, to that letter, just stretching it. Um, shaytor. Good. And just that last word, and um, the noon is flat, so but the ra is round, so um, so we go flat and then round. So, nirajim. Um, okay. Nirajim. من الشيطان الرجيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Just the first word of Surah Fatiha, yeah? Alhamdu. That's quite, so Alhamdu. That'll just loop it around. Okay, then. Lillahi is all flat, so smiling the whole way through. Lillahi. Alhamdu Lillahi. Good, rise round here. Yeah? Rabbil Alameen Good, I've noticed most people um, struggled on the Ba, as surprising as this, even though it's actually one of the easiest letters of the alphabet. Um, because it's got a Shadda, you meant to hold the sound of it. So, Rabbil... What happens, the mistake everyone makes, is the lips tense up, um, which is obviously quite natural. Uh, but just try and bring that awareness to your lips if you can and realize that the bar should be soft sound. So, Rabbil, Rabbil Alameen. Good. And the from, uh, from the Ayn onwards, from the bar onwards actually, it's all flat. So, Alameen. So you can smile the whole way through. Rabbil Alameen. I want you to just notice where your breath is now. And don't worry about your breath. Don't worry about running out of breath. Just remember to breathe in through your nose though. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Good. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim 
Uh, that's a bit hard, man. But we'll focus, we we'll usually focus on that when we do Bismillah anyway. I want to go on to the third verse. So, Maliki. Good. Both smi all three are smiley, yeah? Yawmid. Relatively flat, yeah? The wow is a bit of a round letter. Uh, because of which um, it, your lips will go a little bit round. So, Yawmid. And again, the Dal is got the Shadda, so uh, just need you to, to hold the Dal sound. So, Middin. Good. And the trick here is to give the Dal more time than you think it deserves. Yeah? Middin. Yawmiddin. Maliki Yawmiddin. Yeah, this time breathe, take your time to breathe a little bit. And try and feel the air coming through your nose. Maliki Yawmiddin. Good, mashallah. Very good people, man. I plan to do Surah Fatiha today. But then I thought, I felt like doing the questions as well. So I went on to yesterday. Uh, but we might do this every day, man. I think those questions are, are nice, man. These are like, um, you find a lot of this stuff when you read tafsir of even something simple like Surah Fatiha. Like, um, uh, like when you go, d d like, to understand even something like Surah Fatiha, sometimes questions are what help us actually appreciate some of these kind of things. So, um, yeah, man, I'll, I'll, I think our time's up, man. But Alhamdulillah, man. Jazakallah, everyone, for being here, man. Very nice to have you all. Um, Barakallah, Afiq. Wa alaykum as salam Wa alaykum as salam Alhamdulillah. You as well, man. Alhamdulillah. Good to so see you all tomorrow at six o'clock inshallah man. Inshallah. I mean Barakallah Fik. Oh Sayyidur is here. Sanarika Sayyidur man. How are you Sayyidur man? Sayyidur is fun man. I love spending time with him man. Uh, Brother Tariq was here for the first time man. How, how are you man? How is he gone? Yeah he looked Oh, anyway, no worries, no worries. Okay, good to have you all, man. Snarly come on, man. Good to see you. I guess it's, okay, and all the sisters as well, man. Kulsan, Nuzha, Sister Shad. <laughs> Bye. Uh, Saidor, Snarly come, Saidor. Nice to see you, man. How are you, Saidor? Assalamualaikum Shahzad, Shalom man, good to see you all man, and the sisters, Sister Shadleen, Sister Inaya, Sister Nuzha, good to have you all man, and good son, as well man, Shalom, see you all tomorrow inshallah, 6 o'clock man, Assalamualaikum, I'll end it there man, good to have you all, Assalamualaikum.